So full confession, I did something pretty stupid one time. Well, actually, I've done a lot of stupid things. But this particular incident happened when I was in the eighth grade. Uh, it was opening day, which is orientation day, and there were parents meeting teachers as well as students learning their schedule. And uh, I saw this friend of mine from the old neighborhood, and he was there with his mom. He was a football player, and I'd seen the other football players kind of laughing at each other because they had to wear this jersey to school that day. And so for whatever reason, I thought in my eighth grade mind, I thought it'd be cool to laugh at my friend when he was with his mom. And this didn't go well. He was embarrassed, hurt, angry, and he never forgot it. I was never able to heal that relationship. And <laughs> it's just one of those things I still feel this day when I think about it. And I had a friend, and it was lost because I wanted to be cool. I just felt so stupid. Lesson, never embarrass your friends in front of the people they love and care about. I hurt and lost a friend in one moment, and I mourned it for years. Maybe you felt that kind of mourning in your life. You know, it's the kind of mourning that comes from the realization that you have recklessly hurt someone. Or maybe you've thoughtlessly done something that is destructive. Maybe you never gave it a second thought until you saw the consequences. Now, I've been guilty of this. Maybe you have as a parent, as a spouse, as a sibling, as a friend. However it happens, we sometimes just choose a wrong course of action. And we lose a relationship. Connectedness, trust, respect. We lose our temper at our kids, our wife or husband, our friend. We vent our anger at people who are friends and coworkers for no good reason. We, we show impatience to someone who's genuinely coming to us for help. We overlook a person in need. or We just intentionally ignore them. I confess I've done all those things. And it may seem strange to hear, but I hope that I hope that I mourn every one of those instances. Because every time we act without thought for others, we can lose something valuable. Relationship, connectedness, trust, respect of others. A sense of mourning of those losses can actually be a good thing. And maybe we should feel loss when we hurt others, especially the ones we're supposed to love. So look, here's a thought. Being sad about what we ought to can bring happiness in our future. Sometimes happiness doesn't always look like what you think it does. Are you happy? Are you joyful? Listen, if you determine to make Jesus the Lord of your life, to follow him, to obey his commands, then Jesus will lead you to a real life, a life of purpose and meaning and love. The outcome of a real life is happiness. And it's not the kind of fleeting happiness that's based on circumstances, but a deep happiness that is eternal. Now, we're in a series called The Beatitudes, and we're looking at what Jesus says will lead us to happiness, and it's not what you might expect. In fact, last week we said that the first step to happiness, according to Jesus, is happiness begins when you realize how poor you really are. This week, Jesus uses the idea that mourning can lead us to happiness. So I guess the question is, how does sadness, sadness of mourning, become happiness that is eternal. And this is what I think Jesus is saying. A sin that is mourned is not readily committed again. So I want to stop and ask you a question. What is something you did that you regretted and it changed the way you made decisions for the rest of your life? We've all got them. I want to pray and then I want you to pause the video and ponder this question. Father, speak to our hearts today in this video. Speak to us, God, right now where we're at. Help us to have a heart that is sensitive to when we recklessly hurt others so that we can mourn, so that we can be guided. God, speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So this question is going to come up on the screen. I want you to pause the video, think about it, reflect on it, pray about it. Maybe you can talk about it with somebody and then come back. And I want to share what Jesus says about this idea of mourning and then tell a story about a guy who had to deal with it. The disciple Matthew recorded a particular time in the Bible when Jesus was teaching a powerful teaching. Now, the things Jesus said, he taught in this particular message that Matthew recorded, he probably taught over and over and over again. But Matthew, he records this teaching as a beautifully constructed sermon. Now, the message is often called the Sermon on the Mount. It's one of the most quoted of Jesus' teachings. 
And in this message, Jesus cast a vision for a restored creation, the kingdom of heaven. And he gives direction for a person to live in this kingdom. To be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you, you need to be his disciple. Because a citizen of heaven is someone who seeks to be like Jesus. Jesus taught his disciples, but he intended for this message to be heard by everyone. In fact, it begins like this. Then he, that's Jesus, began to teach them, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You know, last week we talked about this, that blessed really is better translated as happy, content, full. It's the kind of happiness that isn't fleeting, it's eternal. But happiness doesn't always look like what you think it does. Listen to what Jesus says next. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Mourning, we've been talking about it's this hurt we have when we feel a sense of loss. But it's not the kind of mourning that happens when we grieve the loss of a loved one. This is the mourning that we have when we realize our spiritual poverty, like we talked about last week. And in that spiritual poverty, we see what we really lost. Now, in the narrative of the Bible, there was this man who had to come to terms with this kind of mourning. Uh, but not at first. He didn't mourn at first. In fact, like many of us, he made one mistake and then tried to make things better, but actually made them worse because he tried to appear like everything was okay. His name was David. He was a king. He was successful by many people's standards. He's even described in the scriptures as a man after God's own heart. He was a successful poet, a warrior. He was loved by his people. But he was just a man, and one day he got bored. And he saw the wife of another man, and he desired her. And then he strategically took her, and she became pregnant. And so to cover up his adultery, he had the husband killed, and then took that man's wife for his own. And King David already had other wives. That's more than one wife. He had other wives. Uh, and it, 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 it doesn't really seem to bother him. He didn't feel any sense of mourning. Now, before we condemn David, maybe you want to ask yourself, if you do stuff like that, do you find yourself doing what you know is wrong, but you reason out a justification for it? Maybe you're looking at a new person at work, and they seem to really know how to dress, and they're easy to talk to, and they just seem to get you, and you can connect with them so easy, and all of a sudden you find yourself wondering, hey, wait, am I with the wrong person now that I married the wrong person? What it, you you justify really what you know is wrong. Maybe you're frustrated with your job. It doesn't pay you what you deserve. So you take things into your own hands by taking things from the office or the warehouse or the shop. So you can use them at home or sell them on eBay because you deserve to be compensated for what you do. And if they can't do that, then you will help yourself. You know, it's funny. When we willingly do what we know we ought not to do, we tend to justify our sin. And so here's David. He's the king. Maybe he thought he was just enjoying the perks of his office. Maybe he thought he was meant to be with this man's wife over the other wives he had. But this man was one of David's loyal friends. It's a funny thing about sin. The desire to do what we want to do when we want to do it makes us find a reason in our mind to do what we know is wrong, and we make it seem right. Now, fortunately for David, there was a man, another friend, called Nathan. He was a prophet, and he confronted David about his sin. But he did it by telling a story. He told the story that there was a man in the kingdom who had an abundance. He was rich. And the rich man had lots of livestock, cattle, sheep, etc. And the rich man actually had a neighbor who was a poor man. Now, the poor man only had one lamb, one little lamb, and he treated it like a pet, caring for it, feeding it. The lamb played with his kids. The lamb was a treasure to the poor man and his family. So the rich man had a guest coming to his house, and he wanted to give this guest a delicious banquet, so he stored the he stole the poor man's only lamb, slaughtered it, made a meal of it for his guest. And when David hears a story from Nathan, he is outraged. How dare this man do this? In fact, 
The scripture says, David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, this man who did this deserves to die. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Because in a sad way, the man that Nathan was talking about, the rich, uncaring, stealing man, was David. Nathan says, you are the man. David used all of God's given power to him to take something from a family that did not belong to him. And when Nathan uses a story to show David his own behavior, David is outraged. It's funny, isn't it? You know, when we see somebody else's sin, we tend to judge pretty quickly. But David, he realizes he is exposed, and in his heart he is convicted. Exposed to the light of God's presence through his friend Nathan, David sees himself finally as God sees him. And when we see our sin in the light of God's truth, we should mourn. When we see our sin in the light of God's truth, we should mourn. And David does, and he writes about his mourning, his feeling, his sadness in the scripture. He writes, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. And you can, you can hear the aching in his heart. He's confessing his sin to God. He pleads with God for restoration. He goes on in this, this poem he writes. He says to God, turn your face away from my sins and blot out my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and sustain me by giving me a willing spirit. David feels all the hurt and the ache. He feels the consequence of what he's done and the loss that he's incurred. And this, this is the kind of mourning that Jesus is talking about. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be com comforted. Now listen, no one is exempt from sin or selfishness. And we should take this the saying of Jesus very seriously. Here's what I mean. Listen, in my journey group, uh, we were reading and studying the book of Revelation. And there are some pretty vivid descriptions of what happens to those who are going to be with God and those who are not going to be with God in the end. And so the question came up, how do you know what's going to happen to you? Is there a checklist? Is there a ticket to the good place? How will I know God sees me? And the answer actually it lies in this proclamation from Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. You know, the heart that's arrogant, that believes they are all they need to be good, no matter what they've done to hurt others and don't care about their own sin, and they see their sin and they've already justified in their own eyes. According to Jesus, those folks, those people have no place in the kingdom of heaven. In fact, their destiny is permanent exile, death. But the heart that mourns their sin, that seeks to do what is good and right and true, the heart that follows Jesus, that heart, it realizes that it's spiritually bankrupt and seeks restoration with the God of the universe. That heart seeks God and will see Him because God shows up. That heart is tender. That heart realizes its true spiritual poverty. It mourns its sin when it hurts others and God in that heart, and the one who has it will live eternally in the kingdom of heaven. The heart that sees Jesus makes him Lord. The heart that mourns its own sin seeks to be the kind of person that God can shape and grow. So I wanna ask you a question. Have you justified something that you did that you knew was wrong? Has that decision cost you in some way? How do you feel about that today? I want you to stop again and pause the video, and I'm really hoping that God will speak to your heart. Almost all of us have done stupid, hurtful, sinful things, but sometimes we just forget about it. But blessed are those who mourn. Think about this question, when I come back, I want to talk about what it means or what it looks like for us to healthy, in a healthy way, mourn our sin.
So what does mourning our sin look like? Uh, does it lead us to the kind of happiness that Jesus is talking about? Here's what I think. I have three ideas. First, to mourn to be happy, you have to own your own sin. David finally came to terms with his sin, and he owned it. Remember he said, For I am conscious of my rebellion, and my sin is always before me. Listen, if we're going to grow, if we're going to be the kind of people that God calls us to be, if we're going to find the kind of eternal happiness that Jesus is calling us to, we have to come to terms with our own sin. We have to own it. And if you're looking, God will get your attention. God shows up. Maybe he will show you in a video like this one. Maybe in the music or in the message. Maybe in the presence of his spirit as you seek him right now. God will speak to you. And he will speak to you through Christian friends. He will speak to you in his written word. God is not unclear, nor is his calling for your life. God is not unclear, nor is his calling for your life. So then, listen, focus on God's direction. Uh, and that means over your own desires. I love the psalm that says, Teach me your way, Lord, and I will live by your truth. Give me an undivided mind to fear your name. I was wondering what that meant, the undivided mind. You know, the most convincing lies I have ever encountered came from me. Uh, there's this constant challenge for me to say yes to God and no to me because it's me. The conversation in my brain is not really a two-way conversation, so I can be pretty convincing to myself to do what I want to do when I want to do it. But allow God's presence, God's word, and reliable Christian friends that influence you, like Nathan did David, and you will find direction you didn't know existed. That direction, following Jesus, it may seem difficult, painful, challenging, but it will lead to life. Following Jesus requires focus, a single-minded focus. We can't share our focus of Jesus with other things. When we allow our personal desires to have a voice in our life direction, we will eventually veer off course little by little until we crash. Maybe we want to have our cake and eat it too. And maybe we don't mourn when we sin. And I find that too many people don't see the train wreck they're headed for until it's too late. Listen, you are today the result of the decisions you have made yesterday. And where you will be tomorrow is the consequence of the direction you choose today. You have to be aware of God's direction. You have to have a single-minded focus on following Jesus. And sometimes we're going to feel the sadness of our decisions. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. But I don't want you to live in that state of sadness. Instead, I want you to mourn to be happy. While you mourn now, sing for joy. Because we do not have a God who abandons us. We have a king who has conquered death. Now, this, this may seem like the most counterintuitive thing I'm going to say in this video, but think about it. When you come to terms with your sin, when you mourn your actions that have hurt others and hurt God, when you mourn them, you receive God's forgiveness and grow. We do not have a God who abandons us. We have a king who has conquered death so that we may have real life now and forever. And when Jesus teaches his disciples that mourning leads to happiness, he knows that this mortal body will one day become eternal when we follow him. He knows that the whole of creation will be restored to the full goodness and beauty that he created to be in the beginning. He knows that everyone who mourns the consequences of evil our own evil can, because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, be redeemed, restored, renewed. And Jesus is calling you to be a disciple, a citizen of heaven today. And because Jesus has already conquered sin and death, we should mourn our sin. And when we do, it becomes far less likely we will sin in the same way again. We ought to mourn our sin because in Jesus we find redemption from our sin, our selfishness, our hurt that we incur against others and God. 
We ought to mourn our sin because God cares and wants us to have wholeness. We can sing now, even though we're mourning. We can sing now with joy because Jesus brings restoration. We can sing in the present pain and sorrow as we look to the future that is completely healed by Jesus because of what he has done on the cross in the past. Jesus lived, died, then Jesus rose. He lives now. He rules and reigns with God as God. Before Jesus, before we follow him, before we make him the Lord of our life, we are destined for the consequences of our own sin. And that consequence is death. Jesus has defeated death and invites you to life, real life, now and forever. And it, it gives us a whole new insight to another song Another psalm that David wrote, a poem. Listen to what he says. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his name. Hey, so listen, when you're watching the worship video at the end of this, at the end of this video, when you're at a Sunday worship experience, celebrate the good and wonderful God we serve and sing. And remember, this video will end. Sunday comes only once a week. And while the worship for the moment is good, worship attributes worth to the one who deserves it every moment of your life. Worship that God wants is a lifestyle. Worship that God's desires radiates from our spirit and is authentic and true. And when we sing and praise to the King, it should just fuel us to live a life that demonstrates the goodness of God every day of the week. We sing now, knowing that the God who loves us will heal us all while warning the sin we've committed. Growing towards happiness is often painful. We should mourn our sin. Because a sin that is mourned is not readily committed again. Now listen, I want to invite you to reflect and pray. Is, is there a sin you need to confess to God? And after you do that, after you take a minute to, to just think about that, we're going to play a worship video. And I want you to sing. I want you to sing today, knowing this truth, that God will heal. May you be blessed to know this truth. May you mourn your sin and yet look forward with happiness to when God restores you because he will heal. Let's worship together. Wandering into the night One thing a place to hide this weary thought Believe